everybody good morning hope you all are having a good day so far no matter which time zone you're in um, before i hand it over to andrea for the second lecture i just wanted to make a very brief announcement so first of all you'll see in the slack channel uh, for the summer school that there's a link now to video for lectures from the first day i posted them on youtube so that's great. And then also I posted the schedule with the Zoom links and everything for the TA sessions. The first TA sessions are gonna happen this afternoon. Um, so see the, the Slack channel for details about that. Um, I think that the TA sessions are a great opportunity. There's lots of questions, not all of them get answered during the lectures themselves. And so the TAs in part can help also process various questions that we don't get to. Okay, so let me, without further ado, turn it over to Andrea and, um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Boris. Um, yeah, so uh, I wanted to start summarizing, uh, you know, the calculation that we do, did in the last lecture. We, we tried to solve and then finish, uh, you know, this introduction to motivation. <laughs> uh, we tried to solve the interpolation condition. So this is requiring that at the end data points, you know, the model interpolates the data. And what we found out is that, uh, um, well, we could find under certain conditions, uh, we could find what's happening here, could find uh, solutions. Uh, near uh, solutions of the linear system uh, y equal let me call it f linear comma n of theta where uh, f linear is just of uh, x theta is just the first order Taylor expansion of F around the initialization. The initialization was theta naught. Okay, so we could find solution of, of uh, you know this nonlinear system equation of equation near to to the system of equation the linear system of equation uh, that takes their form here as always comma n this is just the evaluation of x one theta at the end data points so let's write i i less than n. All right, uh, so this, this of course must be qualified is under certain condition on the Lipschitz constant of the, of the Jacobian of this, of this model, right? Um, and, and if we want to write this even more explicitly, uh, we could, I mean, I think we define something that was y tilde that it is y minus fn at theta zero. So this is the residuals at the initialization and we defined phi to be the Jacobian at initialization, dfn at theta zero. And this linear system here can be written in the you know, even simpler form that is y tilde equal phi times theta minus theta zero. All right, so, so um, Okay, so this finding suggests that perhaps the following is true. Perhaps we can replace our, our empirical, the whole cost function, our empirical risk. Uh, that is, I remember, takes this form uh, by uh, the cost function that you obtained by uh, linearizing the model.
and this is again nothing else that And, and, and perhaps I can re, re, replace the test error by, okay, I should call this actually here a, a different name to this object, of course. This is not the same object, call it linear. And, and perhaps I can replace also the test error by the test error of the linear model. Okay, and uh, okay, so 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 the punchline is that this is true. Uh, um, this is true, meaning uh, under certain condition, people prove the results of this type, t tri three type of, of conclusion. First of all, uh, the risk, uh, the, the empirical risk goes. Uh, uh, so let me write under suitable conditions. Uh, Professor, can I interrupt with a click? Uh, can I interrupt you with a click? Let, let me finish the sentences. That is under suitable condition, the, uh, you know, Lipschitz constant less than something. Uh, now the following three, three conclusions are true. Uh, okay, so now perhaps I stop and I'll ask you what you are saying. Well, uh, just that uh, in the in the in the equation three lines above this, uh, yeah, you had a L two norm between y tilde and phi times theta minus theta, but a couple of lines above that you identified those two. So yeah, I defined these two. So that would mean that the empirical risk is always zero if y tilde equals phi uh, phi times theta minus theta zero. Ah. Okay, so this is the equation. So this is this is this is the definition. So the y tilde should just be a y. That's the yeah. issue. So yeah. y no 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 y tilde is y minus f n at theta zero is y minus the residual. Okay, so this is a non-zero object, and what I'm saying is that this is the condition for interpolation. I see. Okay. Thank you. For interpolation. Uh, I, Andre, I think they're talking about in the definition of R hat lin on the very right hand side. Yeah. You have y yeah. tilde minus y tilde, seemingly. Yes, that makes sense because no, no, no. Uh, if this, this, is, why, this is not, you know, this is not a definition. This is this is the condition. This is the condition for the risk. Ah, right, right, right. Okay. So this is the exactly the equation. So I'm writing. Uh, you know, first I, I derived that the, the the condition for interpolation that is a nonlinear equation can be approximated by this linear equation. Okay. And then I said, okay, I took a leap of, of fate because I, you know, I don't have time to go in more calculations. And I said, okay, perhaps it's not only the set of minimizers of this nonlinear function that is approximated by this linear set of minimizer, but the whole cost. So of course, you know, as y equal fn of theta is the condition for minimizing this, for getting zero empirical risk in the original problem, y tilde equal phi theta minus theta zero is condition. Y tilde is a fixed vector and theta is a high dimensional parameter. Okay, so, so, so you know, a, a certain number of paper proofs uh, starting from, from uh, you know, probably the first one was Du et al. I'm not giving references because you know it takes a lot of time and and will be always incomplete. But but this whole idea of linearization, uh, you know, started with the paper of Jacob, Gabriel, and Ongler, and and 
mostly what I'm following is, is, is a way of presenting it that is inspired by a paper of Shiza and Bach, I think. Okay, so, but, but uh, you know, so these papers and many others show that under certain condition well, on the Lipschitz constant of the model, the following is true. First of all, the risk, the empirical risk under gradient flow, say, converges exponentially fast to zero. And, and uh, or under gradient descent. And here the, the exponential rate lambda zero is what you would expect from the linear theory. So it's the minimum singular value of, of uh, phi square. If you do gradient descent in this cost, it's easy to check that, that gradient descent always converges to a minimizer and it converges exponentially fast. And the rate is exactly this lambda naught. And this, this kind of theorem says that, yeah, uh, even in the nonlinear uh, problem, it converges exponentially fast and the rate is up to a constant, the same one. Uh, second, the, the parameters, not only the risk goes down to zero, so this is really an optimization thing, but doesn't tell us a lot about statistics. So if you want to do statistics, you want to say something, for instance, about the parameters, and, and one can derive bounds that say, okay, that the parameters says learned by gradient flow in the nonlinear model approximate, are well approximated by the parameter by gradient flow. In the, in the linear model, in the sense that this is perhaps, for instance, much smaller than theta t minus theta zero. Okay, so what is this fill in is, is just the gradient flow in the linear model. Yeah, a third point, uh, third conclusion, um, the linearized model, so, so, you know, if you want to do statistics, you are not that much interested in the, par in the parameters, but you are interested in particular machine learning about prediction error and therefore about the model itself. And third type of conclusion that one can get is that the model is well approximated by, uh, sorry, I should. Much smaller than C. Okay, so let's, let's uh, focus for a second about uh, the, on, the, on the last conclusion of this kind of theory. Uh, what is this? This is uh, uh, the model uh, that is learned by gradient flow at time t. It is a function f, I put dot theta t, it's really the network that, that you have at theta t, and it's a function from Rd to R. This is, uh, this other object here is uh, the model generated by the linearized follow. For, so what does this mean? I solve this equation. Since R hat linear is a quadratic function, this is a linear ordinary differential equation. And then I stick it into the, my, my linearization, linear approximation.
okay? And finally, what is the L2 norm? Well, the L2 norm is the L2, is the L2 norm, right? So G L2 is L2 of the probability measure. So this is the right way to compare two models uh, since the error is, is L2 error, right? So what does this tell us is that basically for a, when you test the two models at a new test point, on average, they are very close to each other. Okay, so, so this yes. suggests the following uh, uh, idea. Uh, so idea, if we believe these, these kind of theorems, instead of analyzing Uh, F uh, analyze the linear, which is much simpler. Okay, so perhaps I'll stop one second and see if there's a question. So there was a question by... Yeah, just one clarification. I, I don't know. Uh, the probability measure is with respect to the data or with respect to the parameters? The Here, the priority is always with respect to the data. Here, are the parameters, there is nothing really random about them. So here, L2 is, you know, if I want to write this even more explicitly, it's really the expectation with respect to a new test point, X. Oh, I should put a square here. I don't know why I cannot see names now, but... Okay, there was other two questions. Hi, yeah, so this, uh, you may have just answered it. So we're not thinking of the parameters of random. So is the gradient flow equation an ODE or is it a, a stochastic differential equation? Because it seems it's like- a, the, It's a, it's a, you know, do you, there is nothing random about this. Okay. And uh, let's see, I didn't write anywhere, but the OD for the, for the linear thing, it's also, and there is nothing random about that. This is the gradient flow that. Okay. So there is a question by Aurea. Yes, thank you, Professor. So if I understand correctly, uh, basically instead of working on a neural network or a deep model or whatever, we can just substitute it for a simple linear model instead? Okay. so. Again, this, you know, as always, when you prove a theorem, <laughs> the important part of the theorems are always the assumptions, <laughs> rarely the conclusions, right? So you have to assume something. Now the question is, is this something satisfied in realistic neural networks, right? Uh, that's an interesting question, right? Um, there is some debate about that. Uh, my opinion is uh, uh, not. Not in many, in many cases, not really, right? But there are simulations and experimental data showing that perhaps it's not such a bad assumption, right? So it's not completely clear that, that the linear model is not a good approximation, right? So there are, uh, you know, people, you know, also at Princeton, like uh, Sanjeev Arora group that try to compare, you know, very good linear methods like kernel, you know, very tailored kernel methods to uh, multi-layer neural network, convolutional neural network, and they show that you know you 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 they don't work so badly, so much worse than neural network, but there is still a gap, right? Um, now the point of view that I'll take in this lecture is that uh, you know perhaps there is a gap. I mean, my personal opinion is that there is a gap. This linear theory doesn't really capture you know the real power of neural networks, but despite this, uh, is uh, very interesting to assume that it, it's correct. Huh? 
and, and derive some conclusions because then some phenomena that seem mysterious in neural network, for instance, the fact that you overparameterize and you generalize well, the benign overfitting phenomenon is not very easy, but can be understood very clearly in these linearized models. So I think that a lot of phenomena that seem, again, mysterious for neural network, you can understand it in the case of, you know, linear models, these linear, uh, linearized networks. So that is the, the, the objective here. It's not as much as to, to say, you know, throw your neural network again and replace it by a neural mod, a linear model. It's about if you want to understand the mysteries of your neural network, you perhaps better understand linear models first. And you see that perhaps they are not mysteries. There is a question by Min. Hello. Uh, I so my question was for like point number three, do we need any niceness assumptions on the input distribution? Do you need any niceness assumption on the input distribution? Yeah, I mean here, um, yeah, of course you need to know something about, uh, yeah, I mean, you can find a theorem that takes this form in the review paper that, uh, that I mentioned in last lecture. And uh, okay, now I don't remember, uh, I could go and look of, at all of the assumption, but for instance, one assumption that is made there is, so you remember that in the, in the, in the last lecture, I, I mentioned the, the Lipschitz constant of the model uh, of, of the evaluation function of, of the Jacobian. So theta, let's say different than theta prime of uh, the Fn, theta minus dfn theta prime operator norm divided by theta minus theta prime, right? So this is the Lipschitz constant of, of the evaluation function. Now there is a, a similar Lipschitz constant that you can define that is, um, let me call it just L without, without subscript, um, or perhaps I'll call it L star just to, Emphasize. So this is Lipschitz constant of the of the model itself, right? So let me write it and then and then comment on it. On what it means. Okay, so I'll write it and uh, you know it will seem like I'm writing exactly the same thing, but I'm writing actually something slightly different. Okay, what is this? Uh, it's the following. You know, F is of theta, you can think of your model as something that takes a, a, a vector of parameter and spits a function. Okay, a model, this is, you take a vector of parameter and you get a function, right? A parameterized model. So this is a, a, a mapping from RP to L2 of Rd, MP. Mm -hmm. so take as input a vector of parameter and spit a function. The function better be L2 integrable because otherwise <laughs> nothing that I'm writing makes sense, right? Uh, okay, and so you know, if you have any mapping, you can define the Jacobian. So what is the Jacobian of F at theta? is again a linear, is, a, is an operator get that goes from this to this. And, um, uh, you know, as every well respect Jacobian, it's uh, a linear operator. So you can think it as a limit of the FN where the number of samples goes to infinity, right? And, and what is this? Well, this is the operator norm of the difference of the Jacobian two point. So now all of this, this object L star, so L star depends on the distribution of the data. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is one condition that you, we, you, know, you need to make 
about this, this model uh, for getting result number three is uh, the condition that this L star is not too, too big, for instance. So the, the short answer is yes, you have to, to, to make some such assumption, but I'm, I'm hiding them under the carpet. Thank you. There is a question by Varun. Yeah, so I um, just, I wanted to know, like going forward, are we going to prove one, two, three, or are we going to show uh, probabilistic conditions on, on our network so that we can have phi satisfy the LN condition to give us one, two, three? Uh, I'm not going to do either <laughs> because, because uh, yeah, so what, what this is meant to be is just motivation. What I want to go into assuming that, uh, let, let, let's now assume that we prove that one to three, we prove that they work for our network or we pretend that they work for our network. Let's see, what can we conclude for the, from them? What, what phenomena emerge from this theory? Now, if okay. you want to study condition for one, one to three, you know, again, I recommend you to look at this review paper. There is a theorem there proved that has exactly this form. And, and there is a list of references that prove more general or, or stronger or kind of all kind of variations of those theories. Gotcha, gotcha. Thanks. Uh, perhaps uh, Sidak. Uh, I'm wondering what happens or are there any assumptions on the rank of the Jacobian? Like if it is both row, it is both row, it is both row and column deficient. Well, wow. okay, so so good question. So that is very important because you know, as as I emphasized in the last lecture, the condition, you know, uh, the the convergence rate of, of gradient descent depends on uh sorry on sigma mean of the jacobian square if i'm correct and the condition was if you remember was something of the form okay one over oh sorry uh lambda naught times divided by y tilde if i remember correctly Okay. So, so as you see already from this, uh, it's very important what is the singular value of the, the Jacobian. So for this all, at least for these theorems to work, normally uh, one needs on one hand to prove that the minimum singular value of the Jacobian is bounded away from zero, and on the other, you know, you know conclude from that, right? Um, so, so, okay, so what is here the situation again? The phi is a matrix that is N by P. And so we'll assume that this is a fat matrix. And, uh, and uh, so this has to be a fat matrix whose hand, no, first non-zero singular value, that is the nth singular value, is bounded away from zero. Uh -huh. and, uh, and actually, you know, hopefully at some point, if we get over it, actually, this is one thing that we will prove, right? That, uh, by the end, uh, I, I will not do the proof, but I, I'll mention a result that implies that this is actually bounded and from zero in two layers of the network. Okay, last question, Alexei. Um, thank you. So here we did not assume anything about theta naught. Is it uh, true that for real neural networks, all these conditions, they will hold only probabilistically in the uh, in initialization? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so this is perhaps some of these questions will be clarified uh, uh, if I if I move forward uh, by epsilon to my lecture. Uh, so perhaps I'll skip the last question. There is a question by Sidak. Uh, if you can keep it and then uh, you know wait you know ten minutes and see if it is answered. Okay, so the plan is uh, the plan of this whole approach is now you know. Trust that the linear theory is, is take a leap of faith, pretend that the linear theory is correct, and then see what are the consequences. Um, now, in theory, we should analyze the whole uh, path of, uh, of uh, gradient descent in the, in the linearized risk. But there is one point, of course, that is the most uh, uh, important. So this is what, again, so this is, Let's, let me write the ODE for you once more. Uh, 
and you know at some point I'll, I'll stop writing the subscript linear so this is minus one over n and then uh, phi transpose y minus phi uh, theta so very simple linear system and if you remember we had this scaling matrix so there is a plus here and actually if you remember we had this scaling matrix i introduced for generality this scaling matrix <laughs> okay so it's a simple exercise and actually theodore i think will do it in one in one of uh, in his ta session is that uh, you know it's easy to compute the you know in the, the limit as t goes to infinity so we are always at p bigger than n and this is full full row, low rank as i mentioned and it's easy to compute the limit t to infinity of this mm. this turns out to be the argmin uh, of theta minus theta naught s minus one norm uh such that phi times theta minus theta naught is equal to y tilde okay so in other words you know the the linearized flow converges to the plumb point that is closest to initialization and the metric depends of course on the on the you know step size matrix and that interpolates the data Okay, so I can write this, of course, also as theta naught plus argmin just by a shift of b s minus one such that phi b equal y tilde. Okay, so so this is the point most interesting in this. In the most inter, the last point is the most interesting point in this trajectory. Now. It would be interesting to understand this trajectory as a function of t. Uh, the reality that, that most works take a compromise and will take the same compromise. And, and instead of analyzing this trajectory, I will analyze a different trajectory that is the ridge, a different path that is the ridge path. So what does it mean, the ridge path? I, Perhaps I put a one over n here. Okay, so instead of looking at its trajectory, theta of t minus theta zero of t, I will look at this behead of lambda. And, uh, and uh, uh, in particular, the limit, so if I call this, and this is okay, yeah, I can put S minus one. And of course the limit, the ridgeless limit of this is equal to this. If I call this, I don't know, B hat hat of T. Okay, so the ending point is the same. The beginning point of these two paths is the same. So you can think of this in this way. If I think of the space of parameters, there is somewhere the, what we call ERM zero. And what we are looking at is, you know, gradient descent starting from it, from a point theta zero. So one thing that we did is that we show that this path is very short, so we blow up. This is what we did. So when we blow up this picture, you get, of course, that this ERM0, this manifold, is basically a hyperplane. Uh, 
this gradient descent path. It's some path in this. Uh, this is theta, sorry. The gradient flow path is something like this. And now we don't analyze really the gradient flow path, but something that is uh, you know, quite close to it. And there's the same beginning point and end point, and this is the uh, ridge path, which is you know, with my notation is theta zero plus b hat of lambda. Okay, and there are actually theorems that says that in many cases, the two paths are kind of quite close point by point. So there is a mapping time to lambda so that the two paths are quite close, but I will not go into that. Okay, um, so, so this is the plan of what we want to do now, analyze uh, linearized models, ridge regression for linearized models. And, uh, and our, our objective would be to do uh, two layers network, two layers neural network. And so what does that mean, remember? So our model is, uh, is this one. All right, so of course the first uh, step towards our goal is to linearize this model. So look at what the linearization of this model is. And uh, this is quite easy. Uh, okay, so let's say that this is at the initialization. Uh, or oh, I call this the initialization. So the initialization is A1, A, N and then W1, Wn. And then if you tailor expand, okay, so I look at F of X theta zero plus B. Okay, so this is, okay, of course there is F theta zero, and then there is the linearization of the coefficient AI. And this gives you just BI sigma. And then there is the linearization of, of the other coefficients, the WI. So let me call this, perhaps I call them, let's call this B1i. Okay, and this I'll call them and this is the first derivative of sigma with respect to its argument, right? So so this is the, I'm keeping all, only the first order terror expansion. So this is the linearized model. Okay, and here the vector B is of course a, Yeah, so each of these B2 is a vector of length D. So this is N coordinate and this is, n times the coordinates. Okay. Okay, so this is our linearized model and, uh, and uh, okay, one way to write it is, uh, is uh, a convenient way to write it is to introduce two featureization map. Uh, I'll call them uh, the first one. I'll call it fear RF. So, okay, I'll introduce a normalization one over square root of n and then sigma w1x 
blah, 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 sigma of Wn x. So this is n-dimensional and the other is uh, the, I'll call it nt. Again, I'll put n normalization, one over square root of nd. And then this is uh, sigma prime w1x, x transpose sigma prime w1x, x transpose. And this is, of course, in r to the nd. Okay, so, so if, you, if you look at the model uh, that I wrote up there, you can write it more elegantly. As of course, there is the zero order term, and then there is alpha square root of n. The normalization is so that, you know, each ent if each entry is of this vector is of order one, the L2 norm of these phi objects is of order one. This is why I chose this normalization. Okay. Um, so, so the model is 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 very simple. The linearized model and any linearized model takes this form. You take the data, you encode them in a longer vector using these featureization maps, and then you fit a linear model. My parameters now are these two vectors, b one and b two, and uh, and uh, uh, for simplicity, I can define, now I had the scaling factor alpha, I introduced it exactly for a unique goal that is to get rid of these annoying square root of n factors and get something that is nicely normalized. And uh, of course I can define a, a, a matrix, a design matrix phi, now my design matrix phi, what is the form of uh, is phi rf x1, and then phi nt x1, blah, 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 phi rf xn, phi nt xn, and is a matrix, of course, that is p by n, as it should be, where p is equal to n d plus one. Okay, so any question about this calculation? Um, I don't have a question about the calculation, but your screen got a little bit more zoomed out. Can you like, is it okay if you zoom it back in? I don't know how that happened. Oh, yeah. Caesar kind of screen. Unfortunately, notability as a binary you know, thing, you know, either full page or zoomed in and A quick okay. question about the feature maps. Um, the result derived above with the the f lin. So this is the Taylor expansion, just with the feature map substituted. This this yeah. So here here what I did is basically I, I took this uh, Taylor expansion up here, and I rewrote it in terms of these you know feature maps. I didn't do any any real calculation. It's just notation. Okay, thank you. Um, where did the AI go? The I, the sum over I. No, the AI, the coefficients. Ah, oh, good question. Good question, actually. Um, okay, so I can always reabsorb this AI in the definition of B two. So I should have written B2 prime here, right? 
Now, there is uh, something to pay attention to. Okay, so reabsorbed, I should write here reabsorbed, redefined. Now, there is something to be a pay attention to is when I look at, you know, in general, the AI are different from each coordinate for each block of coordinates. Um, and so a, a ridge penalty, so an L2 norm of B2 will not be an L2 norm, it will be an a weighted L2 norm in B2 prime. I can you know, simplify my life by stipulating, you know, for instance, that uh, the AI at the initialization, so these are the second weights at the initialization are plus or minus one. Okay, so let's say that they, that is the case. And so at the initialization, the second layer weights are all plus minus one. Okay, um, so now what I want to do uh, really is to learn this model. And uh, so I'll do something else, I, I redefine B2 by including this square root of D. So I'll take, okay, so I want to now fit these two model with the ridge regression. So this means that I fit this model by choosing B of oh, B2 small by fitting B at lambda will be uh, well, exactly as I wrote before. where phi is this matrix. Okay, let's see. And then I had the ridge penalty. Okay, and now, now what I want to do is that I'll take this scaling matrix. Again, this is the reason why I introduced this scaling matrix. I'll take this scaling matrix to be two, two possible values, right? So for the second layer weights is all the same. And for the, sec the first layer weights is all the same. So if you do this now, uh, so I update each of the two layers with the same rate. So you get two regularization parameters that is lambda one and lambda two, and you can do yourself the, the mapping between the, the step sizes and these regularization parameters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So this is the, the linearized model for a, for a two layer network in which I use two different step sides and the two layer. And, and again, at initialization, the AI are all plus minus one. One last simplification that, that we might want to do at some point. Uh, we have been carrying throughout uh, this y tilde. This y tilde is a y minus the evaluation of the model at the initialization. One nice thing to do is uh, to choose initialization, uh, to, so to choose theta zero so that fn at theta zero is zero. And so y tilde is equal to y. And can we do this? Well, actually it's pretty easy to do it. Uh, if you take, for instance, n even, and you choose, for instance, a1, you know, without loss of generality, if the a's are balanced, you can choose the first two, n over two to be plus one, and the other n over two to be minus one. So there is no loss of generality if in this choice. And then I'll choose the W to be 
uh, the last 10 over two to be equal to the first 10 over two. So if you make this choice, of course, at initialization, and then there is minus some Okay, so if you make the choice of this W, this is of course zero at initialization. Okay, okay so this is uh, what I want to focus on. Yeah, and uh, there is a question by Oria. The reason we didn't just initialize theta zero to be all zeros is to avoid the saddle point? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, because this is what uh, people do in practice, uh, they initialize and uh, yeah, there is a saddle point and the most common initialization, most standard initialization is, uh, yeah, to take the W to be a random and, and typically Gaussian or something like this. And the scale of the Gaussian, uh, uh, well, as you'll see, we'll take my scaling will be that X will be of order D typically. So I yeah, will scale x to be, you know, each, each entry is to be of order one, sorry, square root of d typically. And therefore to get wi times x that is of order one, which you need in order for the activation function to be non-trivial, you want probably w, and if you take the w to be Gaussian, has to be normal id over d. Uh, or sometimes they will be uh, uniform on the sphere of radius one, which is uh, very similar. Okay, um, other questions. So our goal, you know, okay, by the end of the lectures would be to try to understand what is, uh, you know, what are the statistical properties, the generalization properties of this model, you know, you can forget of about all the motivation. You have these featureization maps that are kind of weird. You fit a ridge regression, and then you want to compute the test error. Okay, so this is, uh, okay, there is a question by Frederick. Uh, yeah, so did we choose alpha already? So did we choose to be in the kernel regime or like, or feature regime? Huh. Okay, so this is a kind of advanced question. Yeah, so, so one can study a more general alpha. Okay, so what we chose is alpha not equal uh, one. This is what we, we did here. And in general, of course, any choice alpha naught that is of order one um, will work more or less the same. And in, in fact, if alpha naught, then alpha naught is large, okay, let's say larger or of order one, let's say, let's say this way. I mean, there are a bit two questions, right? Here, once you assume that the linear model is correct, the choice of alpha naught is just a model a matter of convenience. When we go back and ask ourselves, is this linear approximation correct? Then for alpha naught large uh, enough, uh, you know, and then this large enough depends also on the width and on other factors then uh, linear approximation correct.
I should say that also you need f n naught of theta zero equals zero. So if you initialize the model to be you know, zero at initialization and you take this alpha naught large enough, then this linear theory uh, is accurate. Namely, the, the, the conditions, the three conclusions that I stated uh, before uh, are correct. On the other hand, we know that if alpha naught is small, uh, it's inaccurate. Uh, and it's actually, I shouldn't say it's inaccurate, it's, it's just wrong. And for instance, one regime that has been one scaling, one other state scaling that has been studied is alpha equal, so alpha naught equal one over square root of n or of order one over square root of n, which means alpha equals of order one over n. So this is a very different uh, kind of scaling in which basically your network is the average of the neurons. So this scaling in particular gives rise to a different type of evolution that is, is called uh, mean field. Uh, evolution or the mean field dynamics or the mean field theory, okay? And okay, so that, that is, uh, is a very interesting different regime. The, the yeah, okay, in, the, in these lectures, I, I will just stick to the linear regime for, you know, because you know, I want to talk about generalization and yeah, that can be understood very well in the linear regime. Okay, thanks. Okay, so uh, that's great. Uh, so we am basically at the, at the end of my lecture one, according to my plan. Um, and uh, okay, let's say if I if I can see a few minutes, so I'll try to collapse lecture two and three in in one. But let's uh, let me start by. Uh, Okay, so so perhaps I'll say a few things about uh, about the next topic that is uh, uh, Gaussian covariates. Okay, so despite being extremely simple, this this uh, these linear models are quite rich, and in fact they are uh, already interesting if you look at an extremely simple model that is, uh, okay, instead of, uh, of uh, this complicated matrix phi, I replace phi by a, a, a design matrix that I call Z, that is NP with IAD Gaussian rows. Okay. So in other words, what we, what we are saying here is that why I, I fit, I'll fit again, let me call it beta at lambda equal. a simple model where Z and the ZI are Um, and so uh, I can assume that the truth here, I will assume that the truth is 
also a linear function. So the model is, as you say, is well specified, where wi is noise. independent of the die. <laughs> okay, so let me perhaps briefly say why, why this is interesting. So I, I'll devote, I'll try to devote perhaps half of the ne next lecture to this uh, Gaussian model, but I want to uh, give you an epsilon of motivation before, before getting there. Uh, you know, look, Traditionally, you say that the statistical method works because you know, the number of observations, you have p parameters. So classical statistics or, or also machine learning, basically you have p parameters. And, uh, or let's, let me call it classical statistics or naive. You have P parameters and uh, this is perhaps significantly less than the number of observation. So you have a certain number of parameters to, to, to learn, to, to estimate and you have sufficient, you know, at least one sample for each observation. If you look textbooks or old textbook, then you, they will say, you know, perhaps you need six samples per observations. Now in, in the 2000, et cetera, there was, you know, a explosion of activity and still is going on about high dimensional statistics. And the typical setting there is now the number of parameters is uh, much bigger than the number of observation, but the catch is that the vector of parameters, beta star, is very structured. Uh, for instance, uh, only uh, S0, much less than nine non-zero entries. So this was the setting in sparse regression and in the compressed sensing and uh, you know, a lot of follow-up work. Now, what we are interested in understanding for understanding this network is a very strange regime in which uh, is the overparameterized regime in which P is much bigger than N. So you have many more parameters than observations. And the other thing here is that you regularized in a very smart way. Here you know, we, are, we want to understand a very strange regime in which the number of parameters is much larger than the number of observations. There is no structure and there is basically no regularization. So we are doing something completely crazy. Uh, in fact, when I started thinking about this problem, I, I couldn't wrap my head about how this could possibly, you know, generalize in a decent way. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the, the question is that if we want to understand that, uh, and you know, if this phenomenon is general, um, so that you have all of this and still you generalize well, would be nice to understand it first in the simplest possible model. And uh, you know, I think this is the really the simplest possible model in which you can understand this. And despite being a linear model, linear models are still the basis of intuitions for most uh, people working in, in this area. Okay, so next lecture, I'll try to devote half of the lecture to this and perhaps half to, to kernel methods. Okay, there was a question from SIDAC, but uh, let me answer. I don't know if I have a minute to answer this question. Maybe I can okay. 
absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'll ask a quick question um, on actually on this part. So you're saying for neural networks, there is no structure, but I'm not sure if I can completely, I'm completely convinced by the argument that neural networks are black boxes. In other sense. No, I'm not saying that is they that is, they are black boxes. I'm I'm just saying you know when you train the neural network, uh, say this two-layer neural network, and you get the weights. So now I get I learn the weights, I train it by gradient descent, and then I learn this vector of weights that are, let's say, just let's focus on the first layer weight, okay, W1. Wn. This is what I call theta. Okay. And the okay, so the following two empirical facts are true, right? Fact number one: if I look at this vector of weights, there is uh, you know very little uh, structure that I can extract from them. Right? And they are not sparse. In general, they are not low rank. It's not, it, you know, unlike, unlike in, 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 in this high dimensional statistics model where, you know, the vector that you are seeking is sparse, the true vector. I mean, let me start from an even more fundamental question. There is not a true theta. There is not a true vector of parameters. It's not an estimation problem, right? There is many vectors theta that achieve good, uh, good prediction. Some of them are structured, some of them are unstructured, etc. So this is very different from the statistical setting in which high dimensional statistics set whether there is a true vector of parameter beta star and that vector is highly structured. Okay. Second observation: when I try to learn this, this parameter theta. You know, there is not a, a very clear way of how should I regularize, right? Should I add the sparsity promoting penalty? Should I add the low rank promoting penalty? Should I add the you know, other type of norm, right? This is not to say there, there haven't been you know, a lot of work on regularizing neural network or on generalization property when this vector of parameter is structures, etc. But it's to say that it's not as clear and obvious and uh, you know, prominent the role of regularization as it is in this, you know, in this kind of development. In this kind of development, really, the reason why it works is that, okay, it's low dimensional, but it effectively, you know, act as a low, you know, it's effectively low dimensional because it, it's sparse, the parameter and vector. In this work, there is no obvious structure in the work, in the vector um, of parameters. But I think one thing that seems to be known from the literature is that the Hessian is uh, quite degenerate, and that is, an important aspect of the structure, right? The Hessian of neural networks, the high degenerate. But you don't put, you, know, you don't regularize for the Hessian, right? Yeah, no regularization. Right. So I mean, uh, you know, empirically, you see that empirically, you you can see a lot of things, right? That you observe. I mean, you you can observe that after you converge, perhaps there is this and that structure. And people have been trying, or these on these properties. So you run the gradient descent, you find a minimum, you find a fixed point or stochastic gradient descent. And then you compute all sorts of observable of this quantity. And um, first of all, and some of them are, are non-trivial, have some non-trivial properties, right? And and now people have been trying, and there is paper correlating this very observable with the generalization because okay, the, the vector that you converge to is perhaps such that the Hessian is low rank, but it's not clear that the fact that the Hessian is low rank is really anything that really matters for generalization, right? So people have been moving one step forward and say, okay, let's assume that 
that does let's look at the set of observable there is a, a work by people at google let's go look at that set of observable and see which one of these observable that we observe on the way it's correlate with the generalization property of the network okay so this is a very interesting work and you know some observable correlate better some other I don't remember which one, some other correlate not as well, etc. So this already tells you that the fact that you observe a structure in the vector of parameters that you learn doesn't necessarily mean to, first of all, doesn't mean that you are regularizing for it. Second, doesn't mean that this leads you to good generalization. Right? But if you want the very fact that now this is a whole research topic in itself, uh, tells you that the, the situation is much trickier than it was in high dimensional statistics. When at the outset you say, okay, welcome, beta star is sparse. And what I'll do, I regularize for sparsity by adding L1 norm, right? There is, first of all, there is one true beta star, that beta star is sparse. Since it's the true one, it generalizes well and I regularize for sparsity. It's a very different situation for say, well, I find a beta star and let's see what are its properties, right? Right. Yeah. Three okay. more questions. Uh, if I can just add a quick comment on the, on the what you oh, asked. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a recent work which says that for okay. linear networks, Hessians are provably degenerate and the, the rank degeneracy is quite okay. significant. Yeah, okay. And okay, you, are, you, you can just send me the... the, the I mean, there is three more questions, so perhaps. Yeah. I, I had a question about, so when you were doing the last simplification uh, in the RF uh, stuff above, mm -hmm. um, maybe I'm like missing something, but what is that? Uh, it's okay. little, yeah, right here. You pick the state as zero, right? So, um, that kind of, um, I, I guess I'm curious if this theta zero would satisfy the, the condition of um, the Lipschitz constant that we did last lecture, because I, at least yeah, so, it's clear in my head. Okay, so, so yeah, again, I, I, so if you, if you look at this review paper and, and Okay, I cite that because it's it's something that I remember better than other thing. But you know, there is many papers, starting again with Du et al. and uh, other. You know, you'll find the theorem of this form. Uh, assume a one, a n, in plus minus one, as above. Uh, so the first n over two and the other n over two, w1, wn over two are IID uniform on the unit sphere. And um, I don't remember what assumption of the data. Hmm. Uh, then if uh, alpha is bigger than alpha, some alpha star that depends on n, n, d, and whatnot. And this is explicitly given in that theorem. Uh, if uh, then uh, linear theory is good. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So it's it's uh, like not good not in the like sense that uh, you know one and two and three holds. Right, so it, it's just to say. So this theorem is just to say that what I'm gonna do <laughs> is not an empty. <laughs> there is a set of cases that is is. It's an exist. <laughs> there is examples that satisfy the assumption that I'm not proving something about the empty set. Gotcha. I, I just wasn't sure if the oh. that choice of theta zero would have like still ruled out. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, I was. I, I, I wasn't hope sure there is no contradiction in what I'm gonna. 
<laughs> no, no, you're good. You're good. Thanks. I appreciate it. No, as I emphasize, this is far from saying that all of these assumptions are realistic. Uh, perhaps Thailand. We are muted. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So my question will also be about um, the unstructured nets of the weights of the overparameterized neural networks. So as far as I know, there's some empirical work uh, that shows that the histogram of the magnitudes of these um, weights seem to follow a distribution um, depending on the optimization algorithm chosen. And like, for example, depending on the choice of this a scaling a s matrix or the choice of different uh, optimization methods, um, SGD or SMD or different methods, um, the weights, the distribution of the, the histogram um, seem to follow an L2 or L1 normalized distribution. So that seems to me that the, the, the optimization simply um, um, it implicitly gives a structure on the weights um, um, during the training. Um, so I'm not quite sure if the no structure assumption is uh, like maybe the optimal um, parameter setting might not have a structure. I don't know that, but at least the optimization, um, the algorithm gives a certain structure um, on, the, on the training dynamics, on the parameters. I mean, this is accurate. So, so here in a way, I, I presented the puzzle, uh, you know, when I talk about no structure structure, I presented it as a puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there is, there is uh, you know, some understanding of this puzzle and the understanding is the following, uh, that, you know, as you see here, uh, in this in this equation, even in this very simple linear regime uh, and with simple gradient flow, there is a, a form of structure that em emerges. And the structure is the L2 norm or you know, this weighted L2 norm in this case. Mm -hmm. So gradient descent implicitly regularizes the L2 norm. In particular, it converges to the minimum L2 norm interpolant. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, now there are, once you have recognized this basic fact, there are two, two things to ask. One thing is that, okay, in reality, we know that this linear theory is not necessarily accurate and uh, all sorts of stranger things are happening in neural network, nonlinear things are happening. What is the norm that, uh, or, or the norm or the complexity measure that is regularized by SGD or mini batch SGD in, in multi-layer convolutional neural network? Right? This mm -hmm. is, a difficult question. There are special cases, there are special examples, but it's a question that is very far from, it's a very important question, particularly Nati, uh, Srebro and co-authors have been obtaining all sorts of interesting results on it, but it's a question that is far from being understood, okay? And probably there is not a single uh, simple explanation, simple complexity match, but it's a very important, okay? So, say what is the implicit regularization or what is the inductive bias. Then there is another question that is orthogonal to it. That is, okay, accept that we have the implicit bias. Like in this linear regime, we know what is the implicit bias. The implicit bias is L2. How is this possible to, that this is sufficient to regularize the network, right? Because I, I'm, you know, if you think of it as, as uh, this is the limit of ridge regression with the ridge penalty equal to zero. No? Uh, if, you, if you take any statistics class, they will tell you that this is a very strange thing to do. And if you read any theoretical machine learning or theoretical statistics paper, this is something, you know, until a few years ago, you would be taught that is something not to be done because in the limit lambda going to zero, you are interpolating the data. So when you are start interpolating the data means that you are regular you are not regularizing enough, and in fact you can you can show formally somehow that uh, you know if you interpolate the data then the Radamacher complexity of your model class is too large, 
Right? So all of the uniform convergence theory breaks down in that region. Okay. So there is a different kind of puzzle is, uh, you know, how is it possible that you have noisy data, you know, okay, the, the cartoon picture that perhaps Misha has shown you, or, or okay, I can draw you if Misha isn't, is, you know, if you have this data, yeah, you see this, yeah. And now somebody tells you, okay, this is the data that correlate, I don't know, education to income, right? And you say, okay, how should you fit this data? Education to, how should you fit it? You say, okay, I'll fit them like this. I'll take set one, I'll take a, a one, you know, a high degree polynomial and I'll fit them like this. Yeah. If you take an undergraduate class in statistics and you do this, you probably will be, you'll be, you get a bad grade. Rightly so, I would say. <laughs> but okay, so, uh, and there is, you know, a tons of theory built to show that this is exactly what you shouldn't do. <laughs> and Radamacher complexity theory tells you that this is what you shouldn't do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and instead, you know, you just do this, and you parameterize a lot, and you just do put a tiny amount of uh, regularization. I mean, the tiny amount means you just um, among all the interpolation, you find the one that minimizes a certain complexity, for instance, L two norm, and you are good. Right. So that's the the mystery on which I want to focus somehow. Thank you very much. Okay, there is Frederick had a question as the reason. Yeah, so um, this rich path seems like a very nice tool, um, which I wasn't so aware of. Um, I'm wondering, is there a reason why we don't just solve the linear equation right away with like singular value decomposition, for example? Uh, yeah, I mean, okay, so I think that many of the things that I'll talk about can be done for the path of, uh, in fact, we did some of them already, but published for, okay. the, for the gradient flow path. Um, it's it's just easier to work with the ridge path. And, uh, All right, okay, thanks. But yeah, it's, it's an excellent research question. And again, I mean, part of taking out the motivation, there are results that say is that in a lot of cases, you know, the difference in the risk is one a factor of 1.2. There is a paper by Rai and Tim Shirani, I think, showing that the two are within some, some small factor in linear regression. So, and so there are reasons not to get too excited about <laughs> doing it, but I think it's interesting. It would be interesting to. Okay. Uh, perhaps I'll, I'll answer the last question from Ori. Uh, I have, I think, some intuition as to why um, increasing the complexity of the model or the degree of the polynomial in your uh, drawing here is a good idea. Because if we are minimizing the L2 norm, then it stands to reason that as we increase the dimension, the L2 norm of the uh, minimal solution goes down. So the complexity of your solution actually goes down as you increase the dimension, right? Yeah. So- Yeah, so that, that is one thing. And in fact, we write this intuitive explanation that there is this paper with Hesti and uh, Saron Rosset, Ryan Tibshiran, you know, we write exactly this argument. At the same time, this is an argument that is not very convincing, right? We write it in the introduction. It's an argument that at least to me is not completely convincing. First of all, who tells you that, you know, this complexity, you know, is that tied to generalization. And then it tells you, okay, the complexity goes down. It, it could go down by a microscopic amount, right? <laughs> and, uh, so it's it's uh, it's really not clear that you know you want to be more quantitative than that. So, 
right? It's not sufficient to say it go down, you know, go down from very extremely bad to very, very bad. <laughs> Generalization is not <laughs> satisfactory. <laughs> okay. Uh, I guess I'll stop here and I'll see you on uh, Thursday or Friday. I think. Okay, thanks very much, Andrea, for the very nice thanks. lecture. Um, yeah, we have a break for about five minutes until <laughs> the next lecture starts, but it's great. I think it's good to have lots of questions. Um, yeah, so see you all in just a couple of minutes.
Okay, hi everyone, welcome back for our second lecture. I'm very excited for this one. Um, before I let Dan take over, let me just briefly introduce him. Uh, so, so first of all, this uh, third main course is actually going to be given jointly by Dan Roberts and Shoyeda, but as far as I understand, Dan is going to give the first couple lectures, and then Sho will give a couple lectures. So I'll introduce Dan right now, and then I'll introduce Sho when he comes a bit later. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, of course, Dan. Dan got his PhD in physics from MIT in 2016. Uh, and he now is a principal researcher at Salesforce. He's also a research affiliate at the Center for Theoretical Physics at MIT at, at, and at the NSF Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, also I think mainly based at MIT. Um, so, so Dan is someone who I've known for a little while and I've really always enjoyed talking about uh, neural networks and various theoretical questions with him. So, so I'm really excited for this series of lectures. It'll be primarily based on a book that was recently completed called The Principles of Deep Learning Theory, which he wrote together with Shoyeda, and it was based on some collaboration that the three of us had done previously. So uh, with that, please take it away, Dan, and correct any mistakes that I made in the introduction. Thanks, Boris. Um, I think the only only error I noted is that the, I should note that the iFi Institute is also at Harvard, Northeastern, and Tufts, I believe. But everything about me was uh, was was great. Oh, great. Um, I didn't realize. Thanks. And also, thanks for um, inviting Sho and I here to give one of the the main uh, courses in 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 this uh, meal or um, summer school. Sorry, I didn't eat lunch. I guess so. Food is on the mind, but. Uh, and also, I think you basically covered all the material in my info slide, intro slide about uh, what the lectures are going to be based on, um, who it involves. So, so thanks for for covering all of that and and for inviting us. So, um, so to begin, um, we'll just start with a brief introduction to what the course is going to be about. And um, in some sense, this part doesn't need to be belabored. We're all here because AI is really interesting and exciting right now. Um, and not only is it exciting, but um, artificial intelligence systems are, are very big. They have, they have many numbers of elementary components. Um, and um, so one aspect of, of the lectures that we're gonna cover is going to involve um, the fact that these, that these are really big systems that, that we're interested in studying. And uh, much of the success behind these systems is, is in the framework of deep learning which uses um, artificial neural networks as an underlying model for AI. I think given that there's now been three main lectures and day of symposium, uh, I don't have to belabor some of these facts. Um, and uh, finally, uh, it's thought that part of the real power of this framework comes from the idea of representation learning. The idea that uh, deep neural networks with many um, neuro neurons organized into sequential computational layers um, can learn useful representations. And um, so um, in, as a high level summary, our lectures are going to be about um, these very uh, large models uh, that, that um, and we'll try to understand how this representation learning property um, comes about. And so the, the goals overall is to um, understand uh, as close as possible um, realistic deep learning models, realistic neural networks. And hopefully we can put forth a set of principles um, that, that enable us to um, analyze theoretically very deep neural networks um, that, that, that say practitioners would actually care about. Um, and we'll try to understand the mechanisms in these models that, that lead to such interesting results that, ha that have brought all of us here. Um, so to initialize your neural networks to this task, um, in, this, in the beginning of this lecture, um, we're gonna explain at a high level, uh, why, why is such a goal even obtainable in, in theory for, for such large and complicated models? And I'll try to guide us um, and explain how we're going to get there in practice over the course of, of the uh, five lectures that Joe and I are, are going to deliver. Um, so to begin, I'm gonna give a high level overview of our method and in some sense provide a minimal explanation for why we should expect, say, a first principles theoretical understanding of deep neural networks to be possible. And then we'll, um, I guess, as I already said, fill in the details over the course of the coming lectures. 
So I assume everyone did their pre-reading or if not, at least paid attention to some random sampling of the lectures that happened already. So um, I probably don't, again, have to belabor that a neural network is, is some sort of recipe for computing a, a function. Um, and it's built out of many computational units that are called neurons. I've uh, posted a, or this below is a cartoon of graph, well, a graph of a very simple neural network. Um, and um, the neural net, each, each uh, circle represents a neuron and each neuron is, is itself a very simple function that considers a weighted sum of incoming signals and then fires in a characteristic way by comparing the value of that sum against some threshold. And neurons are then organized into parallel layers as the, the figure demonstrates. Um, and deep neural networks are those that are composed of many multiple layers in sequence. And I'm, hopefully this is just all familiar to, to everyone. So the structure of neural networks are, is going to be very important for what we're going to say. But for a moment, let's just ignore all the structure and simply think of a network as some sort of complicated parameterized function, f of x um, parameterized by theta, where x is going to be the input to the function and theta is some sort of vector of a large number of parameters controlling the, the shape of the function. So um, for, for such a function to be useful, we need some way to tune this high dimensional parameter vector theta. So um, typically what, it, what is done in practice uh, is we choose some initialization distribution by randomly um, for, for the parameters and then we randomly sample um, the parameter vector from some sort of computational, com for, from some computationally simple probability distribution, um, P of theta. And typically the parameters are say, IID Gaussian distributed. And uh, in the following lectures, we're gonna say quite a lot more about this. Uh, this is just, again, a high level picture of, of, of how things are typically done in practice. And then second, we adjust the parameter vector um, in some way, such that the resulting uh, network function, f of x uh, um, parameterized by theta star is as close as possible to some desired target function, f of x. Um, and, and this is called uh, function approximation. And typically this sort of thing is useful when there's a function um, that that is very easy to describe, for instance, you know, is the input, if it's an image, does it contain a cat or not, but would be hard to um, algorithmically define a set of rules as, as is done in traditional programming that would that would output that function. And for, the, for, this, for this to work, um, we need to find tunings, the theta stars, such that um, we that the network function can be um, can can uh, um, perform the tasks that at hand, and and to do that, we we use training data consisting of many pairs of of the form x comma f of x uh, observed from the desired but partially observable target function f of x, um, and so making these adjustments is called training the adjustments of the parameters and the particular procedure used to tune them is called the learning algorithm. Um, and what we'd really like to do is understand the macroscopic behavior of this function from a first principles microscopic description of the network in terms of these trained parameters. So in other words, we would like to understand why a particular function or maybe a distribution of functions um, make some predictions say whether certain images contain cats or don't contain cats or understand how they make those predictions, um, starting from a description of the function in terms of its constituent components, like the weights and the biases. Um, and given, as, as has already been emphasized by some of the other lectures, the high dimensionality of the parameters and the degree of fine tuning required for, the, for this approximation, this, this goal in principle might seem naive and beyond the reach of any uh, theoretical approach. So um, let's, 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 Think a little bit more in detail about why why this such a thing is is going to be so hard, and um, maybe analyze what sort of problems that we might encounter. So, uh, one one way to see the kinds of technical problems that we'll encounter uh, is is to tell or expand our trained function f of x parameterized by theta star around the initialized value of the parameters theta. So we start um, from some random sampling of p theta. Um, with some initial parameters and then 
through some procedure that I outlined on the past few slides, we arrive at some theta star. So now we're going to express this fully trained network uh, as a Taylor expansion around the point of initialization. Um, and here um, I'm being entirely schematic and ignoring for a moment that theta is a vector and the derivatives of, of F are, tens are, are tensors. Um, and uh, so, so uh, we'll, we'll return to this in detail later, but this is just meant to be schematic. And the Taylor expansion illustrates that, uh, sorry, um, and I, don't know, I forgot if I said this, but the derivative should be taken to be evaluated. The initialized value of the parameters, it should make sense to you as a Taylor expansion. Great. Um, so this Taylor expansion is going to illustrate that there are three main problems that we're going to have to overcome in order to describe the fully trained uh, networks. So first, uh, in, in general, uh, the Taylor series is going to contain an infinite number of terms. And in principle, we need to compute them all. Uh, more, more, more specifically, as the difference between the trained and initialized parameters becomes large, so too does the number of terms needed to get a good approximation of the trained network function f of x when parameterized by theta star. Problem number two, since the parameters are randomly sampled from p of theta, as I described, each time we initialize our network, we're going to get a different initial function f of x parameterized by theta. And we, we need to determine the mapping um, that takes us from the distribution over parameters to the distribution over the network function and its derivatives. So um, each, each term is uh, in the Taylor expansion is really a random function of the input x. And this uh, joint distribution, this p of f and its derivatives, is going to, in general, have intricate statistical dependencies. Um, and even if we set aside for a moment the infinity of functions um, that, that we discussed on the previous slide with the first problem um, and consider the marginal distribution over the network function only, so p of f, um, there's still no reason in general to expect that it's analytically tractable. And in general, um, it won't be analytically tractable. So these first two problems, in some sense, are really about the statistics of the network um, at, at initialization. So due to this sampling procedure for the parameters and the way we're, we're defining these functions, um, there, there's some complicated statistics um, that, that are needed in order to understand and describe the, these models. Um, so, so these first two problems are going to be about statistics. The third problem is, is kind of orthogonal to the other problems, and it's, it's more about dynamics. And so the, the final thing that we, we would need to understand is, um, is, is how to compute the learn value of, 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 of the parameters theta star. And in general, it's the result of a complicated training process. And um, in general, it's not unique and can depend on literally everything. So here um, we see it can depend on um, the initial value of the parameters. It can depend on the function at initialization and the infinite number of the derivative terms. It can also depend on the choice of learning algorithm that we used in order to uh, uh, find theta star. And of course, it's got to depend on the training data because it has to depend on the, on the task that we're trying to accomplish. I mean, that, that last part is in some sense um, makes, should, make, should make sense. Um, so, um, and in general, determining an analytical expression for theta star must take all of this everything into account. So um, yeah, so, so putting, putting these three problems together, if, if we could solve them, then, then we would understand the distribution over trained network functions, P of F star. Um, and what we mean by this is, is that it's now conditioned on a, on a simple way. Um, or what we mean is that we, we would have a representation that, that would be conditioned on a simple way on the choice of learning algorithm and the data that we use for training. Um, and um, what, what we mean by, sorry, before I go on, what, what we mean by simple is that it would be easy to evaluate this distribution, this F, um, P of F star um, for different algorithms, different learning algorithms or different choices of chaining data without having to solve problem a version of problem three each time. So um, when, when we uh, train neural networks in practice, every time we wanna train a neural network, we have to run some version of, of a gradient-based learning algorithm, let's say, each time. Um, that's, that's not what we mean by condition in a simple way, even though the answer 
of the fully trained network depends on that learning algorithm. Instead, we mean that there's some simple expression, for instance, for which we can plug in different choices of learning algorithm and plug in different choices of training data. And I will, um, over the course of these lectures, this, this point will be made clear. So um, the development of a method for the analytical computation of, of this fully trained distribution is the principal goal uh, of these lectures. So um, in, in general, solving these problems for a general function f is, is, not pox, is not possible. So in order to make progress, we're going to have to take into account some aspects of the structure of the problem, in particular, how we're defining these neural networks or the, the, the structure of the network. Um, and so um, luckily, we only care, we don't care about general functions, right? We only care about or the things that are interesting for this problem right now are the functions that are deep neural networks. Um, so I've um, paid, um, illustrated an, a network again. And um, yeah, so while the specifics of how this works is going to be covered in detail over, over the coming lectures, I, again, right now, I'm just gonna try to give some, some uh, intuition for, for how the complications, the three problems that I described on the previous slides can, can start to be resolved. Um, so, um, so yeah, so to make progress, we'll have to make use of the structure uh, of this network. So, so what do we mean by that? So in a, in a coarse grained way, there's, 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 um, well, so, so to, in a coarse grained way, two kind of primal aspects of a network are, you can think of as its width and its depth. So, um, for, for the network on this slide, um, we would have, um, a width N, uh, of five neurons in, in the hidden layers, um, these 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 are the hidden layers and there's five circles and um and then we would have a depth l capital l of four um counting the three hidden layers and then the output layer at the top and so these are in some sense a coarse grain way to think of the structure of this this simple kind of network um by the way i i guess i assume most of you are familiar or you read um our pre-reading but this type of network is called a, a multi-layer perceptron um, in modern terms, it's sometimes called a fully connected network. And much of what we're going to talk about is, is, is going to focus on, on deep multi-layer perceptrons, deep MLPs, although the framework in many ways can, can um, carry over to, to um, other deep learning models, but this will be our primary focus. So, um, so in general, in many complicated statistical systems, there's often simplifications to be found in the limits of large number of components. Um, and uh, this, this potentially is familiar to you if you're familiar with statistics under the idea of the central limit theorem. Um, it's familiar to people that study physics in terms of say why we can describe the gas um, in, in, in the room. Um, there's, there's a large number of gas molecules in the, in the room and, and um, in the limit of a large number of molecules, we're able to have a very simple thermodynamic description of how the gas works. And um, in many systems, um, it's natural to sort of ask in the limits of large number of components, whether there's um, simplifications that can be found. And given, so given that the sort of two coarse grained ways that we're looking at this very simple network structure, there's kind of two primal ways that we can make a network grow in size. So we can increase its width by holding its depth fixed, um, or we can increase its depth by holding its width, width fixed. Um, and um, it'll turn out that, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not enough to just consider any massive macroscopic system, uh, taking the right limit actually requires some care. And what, what we're going to find is that in this case, the, the, the limit where we let the width grow, holding the depth fix will make everything really simple, while the limit where we let the depth grow, holding the width fix is really hopelessly complicated and also useless in practice. So um, I guess that's just a caveat to be careful when studying these sorts of limits, but luckily there is a nice limit and we'll explain, um, I'll try to give intuition on the next few slides why it's, why it's simple and why it's interesting. Um, and so the simple thing to do, as I was saying, is to take the limit where we let the number of neurons in, in the hidden layers uh, go to infinity. And this is an idealized neural network limit, and uh, which is known as the infinite width limit. And as a strict limit, of course, it's rather unphysical. You, you can't directly program a function to have an infinite number of components on a finite computer. 
Um, so so the the utility of this limit is is not to uh, is, is as, as a starting point for trying to understand these sorts of functions. And importantly, we're going to go beyond this limit to try um, to try to understand um, whether these. Well, first, we should ask whether whether despite being unphysical, it provides a good theoretical model for 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 real networks that 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 exist on on computers or you know in the cloud and GPUs. Um, so so that's the first sort of question. And then in the cases where it doesn't, we, we want to understand how to extend our theory to go beyond this limit. But in any event, um, often it's good to start at a simple point and and then slowly add complexity. So this is a simple place to start. Um, and as, as I'll explain on the next few slides, this extreme limit um, does massively simplify the distribution over fully trained networks, um, rendering each of our problems, three problems um, that I discussed completely benign. And as a preview of how that works, let me just overview what that looks like. And again, these details will be covered um, in, in the coming lectures. So first, uh, addressing the first problem of the infinite number of terms in the Taylor expansion, uh, the higher derivative terms at infinite width are going to effectively vanish. And so we only need to keep track of two terms, the function and its derivative at initialization. Addressing the, the second problem, the distribution of these random functions of the function and its derivative are going to be completely independent. Um, and each marginal distribution factor is gonna take a simple form. So not only do we not have to compute a joint distribution of an infinite number of of, of functions, um, we also find that of the two functions that we joint the, we have to compute a joint distribution of two functions, and they're independent and and actually quite simple. And then finally, addressing the the, the dynamics, the issue of the dynamics, um, the uh, training dynamics are going to become linear and independent of the details of the learning algorithm in this limit. So we're going to be able to find theta star the the fully trained parameter vector in a in a closed form analytical solution, um, and that's not going to notice. It doesn't um, the the words learning algorithm don't appear after the semicolon. So we only have to. It's only going to depend on on the function and its derivative, and per, perhaps the initialization, and then of course the training data in a simple way. So things are very simple in this limit, and uh, we'll explain we'll explain how uh, in in the coming lectures. Um, and really, these these simplifications and 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 in some sense, the this whole notion of large number of components making things simple is is a consequence of a kind of principle of sparsity um, that 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 occurs when 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 you take this limit. And the the fully trained distribution um, then is is actually just going to be a simple Gaussian distribution with a non-zero mean. On the other hand, or uh, uh, unfortunately, I should say, uh, this limit is, is, is in some sense too simple. Um, and so the, the formal limit uh, leads to a poor model of, of a deep neural network in practice. And, um, and uh, yeah, so, so in other words, oops, something happened, there we go. Um, the, in other words, what, what we find is that the infinite, not only is infinite width limit, not only is infinite width an unphysical property for a, a network to possess, but the resulting uh, train distribution leads to a of, of such networks leads to a mismatch between the theoretical description um, that this theoretical model that we're talking about and the practical observations for networks of, of more than one layer. Um, and for um, to to elaborate on this further, one point that I think some people have brought up. Uh, in particular in the last lecture and and just is empirically motivated fact but at least i'm some of you seem to be aware of this is that the distribution of real train networks do do depend on on the properties of the learning algorithm used to train them so that's that's one point of mismatch um second uh infinite width networks don't don't learn representations so for for you know any any input um the the hidden layers are are not um learning um uh, useful features from the data and transforming the data in some way that can then be used um, in in some sort of um, coarse graining type process in order to in order to uh, solve the task at hand, which is uh, 
Um, I didn't give evidence for this, but this is thought to be one of the important uh, properties of, of, of deep neural networks. And in particular, it's a property of, of, of neural networks that have, well, I said deep, but it's a property of neural networks that have expected to be an important property of neural networks that have many, many layers. Um, and so, you know, this as, as kind of the, uh, I guess one other, the, the, the notion of representation learning is often used to describe in a heuristic way what neural networks are, are doing. Um, for instance, if you have an image of a cat, it's a cartoon of what the way a classification works is that each layer would then start with very fine grained features. For instance, you'd start at the pixel level and then you would uh, learn to detect properties like fur and then maybe you would learn to detect properties like tail and, and whiskers and then you would learn to detect properties like like head and body and and sort of this sort of coarse grain notion of of of, of feature learning is is part of the heuristic description of how um, multi-layer neural networks work and assuming that um or and it is also supported by by some empirical studies so yeah. so this uh yeah go ahead representation learning uh, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Join question the back. I I I can't I can't understand. Uh, can I take this opportunity to ask a quick question? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so in in the previous slide, when you said that uh, the learn func uh, function is a Gaussian distribution, uh, a yep. non-zero mean Gaussian distribution. Uh, yep. So is that saying that we start uh, at initialization, it's a zero mean Gaussian and then the mean shifts as we train or? Um, we... Yeah, yes. Um, uh, the, and typically that, that's, that's the case. Um, I mean, it depends on how you pick your initialization distribution and, and show, show will cover that in, in, a, in a subsequent lecture. But um, I mean, maybe it's simple enough to say that, that the network output at initialization is one Gaussian distribution and then the fully trained one will be a different Gaussian distribution and we'll cover the details. Okay, thank you. So, so uh, yeah, go ahead. So essentially uh, infinite nitwit neural networks are linear regression models with uh, kernel feature mapping in the kernel regime? Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this. Okay. So yeah, you, you, I think you know where where this is going, so so we'll talk about this. The um, kind of the, I would say the. Well, um, let me let me continue, and and um, I'm sure you'll you'll be satisfied. So, um, I was just making a point about representation learning. I probably don't need to belabor this, but the the main the main the main point that I want to make is that is that um, this 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 linear model or this this infinite width model, sorry, um, is is a good starting point, but there's a breakdown of correspondence between theory and reality, and it's important to go beyond it. So let me um, continue. Um, and yeah, so so paraphrasing von von Neumann from 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 the beginning of the slide, really the the central limiting problem here is that the input of an infinite number of of signals to each neuron is such that that the law of large numbers it kind of obscures the correlations between the neurons that, that can get amplified over the course of training for realistic networks um, and which lead to representation learning. And, and we'll discuss in detail how this works. But I, at a high level, the, the point is that, that there's, there's these correlations between neurons that get obscured at the infinite width limit within a layer. And we need to find a way to restore and then study the interactions between neurons that are present in these realistic finite width networks. Um, so to do so, we're going to use uh, a tool that should be in everyone's toolkit, um, perturbation theory, and um, study deep learning using what's called the 1 over n expansion, which is kind of a special um, magical kind of perturbation theory where rather than a small parameter, we have a large parameter, and we, we're going to expand in the inverse layer with 1 over n. Um, so we take a large parameter and we take its inverse, then we get a small parameter, and we're going to use that as our small parameter of expansion. Um, and so we can take the fully trained distribution P of F star and we get uh, a series. The first term is that infinite width limit, the Gaussian distribution that I discussed on the previous slides. 
and then there's going to be a sequence of of corrections. Um, and uh, this 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 sort of uh, well, uh, on in these lectures, we're we're actually just going to focus on on the leading correction, this the the first one over n term in in the sequence. Um, and uh, this will in fact be simple enough to to keep our three problems tractable. Uh, so at uh, addressing to uh, going over going over these problems again uh, to now see what happens when we relax the infinite width assumption first for the first problem um, most of the derivative terms will contribute um, at order one one over n squared or smaller so in fact rather than needing to keep track of two terms now we'll need to keep track of four terms we'll need to keep track of the function and its first three derivatives at, at initialization um, so in, in this sense, the, this principle of sparsity is still limiting the dual effective uh, description of, of the network, um, but not quite as extensively as in the infinite width limit. Addressing the second problem, uh, the distribution of these random functions at initialization will now be nearly simple at order one over n. So first of all, again, we don't have to uh, correlate uh, or find the joint distribution of an infinite number of functions. We only need uh, the function and its first three derivatives. Um, and uh, things won't be independent anymore, but uh, it'll be tractable and we'll be able to work out uh, this distribution in full detail using perturbation theory. And then addressing uh, the, the, the third problem, uh, the nonlinear training dynamics. Uh, the training dynamics are nonlinear, they're no longer linear, but uh, the nonlinear dynamics can be tamed with the dynamical perturbation theory. And we'll be able to find um, theta star, the, the trained parameters, again, in a closed form analytical solution um, up to perturbative corrections. Um, and this will depend on the function and its first three derivatives, the initialization. And now it also will depend on the learning algorithm, importantly, um, in, in correspondence with, with what happens in practice. Um, and so we'll, um, yeah. And so- uh, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so in the previous um, uh, slide of, uh, of to solve problem one, we, we keep track of four terms. I, I remember finding this a little bit uh, unusual. Is it because you can prove that beyond the fourth term, stuff becomes smaller than one over n squared? Uh, the, the four seems a little surprising. Yeah, it's surprising, but that's 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 the phenomenology of, of MLPs. You, you um, so uh, I'm not sure I have a, Better answer than that. What, what you said at the beginning is is true. Um, you can show okay. that the higher order terms are suppressed at order one over n squared. So if you're truncating at order one over n squared, and I'll discuss why that's a, a reasonable thing to do, then you don't care about anything else. Just like um, these terms scale like order one over n. So when you're studying the infinite width limit, you only care about these terms because in the infinite width limit, things that are one over n are treated as zero. Um, All right. And so, awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so these, these are now <laughs> near simplifications, if you will, um, and are again, a consequence of the idea that things simplify when you have a large number of components, although now we're backing off from that very strict limit um, and our dual uh, effective theory description of these fully trained um, network distributions at truncated to order one over N um, will, will now be a nearly Gaussian distribution. So it won't be Gaussian uh, and it will have high order um, cumulants or connected correlators that are non-trivial and we'll be able to characterize the interactions between neurons and also understand things like representation learning. So um, this is a preview. I didn't prove anything. We're going to explain this in detail over the course of the lectures. And uh, so be before I, uh, or sort of wrapping up this introduction before before we begin with, with actually going through how this works in detail, uh, I just wanna comment for a second on, on potential subleading corrections. Um, and this relates to the previous question. So an important byproduct of studying uh, of studying low leading corrections in the, in the way that we're going to study is actually a deeper understanding of this truncation error. So what, what we're gonna do is define um, the aspect ratio of the network. Um, so using the symbol R and L again is the depth, the network depth and N is the network width. And what, what we'll show is that we can recast our understanding of infinite width versus finite width or shallow versus deep um, in, in, a, in a slightly different way. 
or we can understand it maybe in a little more deeply, if you will. So in the, in the strict R going to zero limit, the interactions between the neurons turn off. And this is the infinite width limit. Um, and um, you can imagine on your computer practically training at some network where R is for all practical purposes near zero. So maybe you're, you have a two layer network and you have 10,000 neurons per layer, you know, you'll, you'll have, uh, you know, that, that, that type of network, for that type of network, the infinite width limit may be actually a decent description. But in practice, uh, these networks are not really deep. Um, they're, you know, as effectively their relative depth is going to be zero because R going to zero means L over N is going to zero. So, so one, one thing we're going to find out through this analysis um, is that uh, deep, deep networks uh, are not described by this infinite li width limit. So if, if the important property that you're trying to describe is, is, is a consequence of the depth of the network, it's not really gonna be captured by this limit. Um, then in, for non-zero R, but still small, there are non-trivial interactions between the neurons as, as I alluded to. Uh, and the, the finite width um, effective description truncated to this order is going to give an accurate accounting of, of the fully trained network function. And we could say that these networks are effectively deep. So they, they are not, um, you know, the, the R is, R is non-zero. So, so there's some consequence of depth, um, but our theory is able to describe, um, is able to capture the effect of, of, of these non-trivial interactions and, and the non-trivial depth. So then you could ask, well, what about, um, what about much deeper networks? Um, so for some a regime where, where the aspect ratio is larger, um, first of all, theoretically, the neurons are going to be strongly, strongly coupled. Um, and um, the, the, the description is going to require the additional terms that we truncated. Um, in practice, these networks are going to behave chaotically and, and there's not really going to be a good effective description. Um, there's going to be large fluctuations between different realizations of the network parameters from instantiation to instantiation. And these networks are not really trainable. Um, and so we'll call these networks overly deep. And, and really what this analysis will show is that networks of practical use are going to have small aspect ratios, um, R near some optimal uh, aspect ratio, R star, that's, that's small, but non-zero. Uh, and um, depending on how quickly we go through these lectures, we may talk about there are ways of, of um, approximately calculating this, this, this scale, this R star, that tells you sort of, you know, as for different activation functions, how how deep uh, networks should be such that they're in this effectively deep range uh, regime. Um, and so um, so not only are we going to understand the, the corrections to the infinite width limit, we're also gonna understand the regime, in some sense, the regime of validity of, of, of this description and understand why um, the, the corrections in some sense are not going to be uh, important because they would only really be needed um, for networks that are not of practical use. And so to conclude um, your initialization, uh, the, the, the point that I wanna emphasize is to really describe the properties of multi-layer neural networks. Um, in other words, to understand deep learning, really deep learning, we need to study large but finite width networks. And I think, yeah, so that um, is the end of the first part of this. Um, maybe uh, I, if there's additional questions, I can take a few questions um, before moving on to the, to, the, to the next part. Great. So. Um, sorry, I, I just wanted to ask all of the, these chapters, they're from the, the, the pre-reading, like the, they're corresponding to the pre-reading chapters? Um, Sorry, which which things? Um, the, like it, you have like 0, 7.1, 10.4. These are all oh, from like the book, the principles. Of sorry, I, I was about to explain that. Um, great question. Yeah, so so this is our this is our course plan. Um, the the chapters and sections are, are from are from the book, the principles of deep learning theory. Um, the archive link was at the beginning of the slide, I believe, um, or we'll post these slides so you don't have to worry about um, writing writing these sections down. But um, roughly speaking, the lectures will correspond to the sections uh, listed here, um, and uh, um, and the lectures will co will cover these um, will cover these topics. Um, and uh, I think I answered your question. It looks like there's another hand, maybe. So another question. 
Oh. Hi. So I'm wondering if there is also the possibility to study uh, another structural parameter of neural networks, that is the degree of each of the neurons. So from fully connected to something just like a convolutional network. Yes, uh, you're asking whether this formalism just applies to NLPs or whether it applies to other structures as well, I think. So right, if I were to vary mm -hmm. the connectivity patterns. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. So, so yeah, in general, the, the, the framework that we're going to describe um, can be extended. Um, and um, when, when we, I, I believe that when we discuss um, where the input of MLP goes in, we'll, we, can, we can point out how you could use that to study other networks. Um, our, our reason for studying MLPs is, is uh, more as a pedagogical tool and uh, as a way of picking uh, a model that's, that's rich enough to capture what makes deep learning exciting. Um, for instance, understanding representation learning um, and understanding the, the importance, I should say, understanding the importance of depth and how the role of depth plays in, in, um, in these models, um, but still be simple enough to be pedagogical. But, but this is kind of a general framework and can be extended to, to other models. Um, is there one other question? I'll take one other question before moving on. Um, uh, yeah, is there any uh, experimental understanding on how big N should be so that like leading one over N correction would become prominent? Right, so I, I sort of addressed this, and we'll, we'll cover it in more detail. But but the the well, so a further theoretical understanding is that it's not just one over n; it's l over n, and we can actually compute um, explicitly what um, either the variance of different observables, like the network output, um, like fluctuations between um, instantiation to instantiation of models, like. Like those things can be computed and and then verified experimentally. And sort of the 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 relevant scale to keep in mind is L over n, and it will you know all the corrections will always be L over n times some order one number. Um, so, yeah. So let me let me move on, and I can take questions, additional questions at the end. So, um, in the rest of this lecture and in in my second lecture, I'm gonna focus on the dynamics. Uh, so, problem three and then show in lectures three and four is gonna go back and focus on the statistics, which is problems one and two. And uh, even though we presented them one, two, three, as I said before, these are sort of orthogonal problems. And um, so we can cover them in, in any order. And uh, also the studying the dynamics will be nice because we'll be able to um, study a larger class of machine learning models, some of which that are, uh, for instance, Andrea covered before, like the linear model, and we'll be able to understand how neural networks fit in into different classes of, 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 of machine learning models and, and sort of understand all their dynamics in aggregate. So to begin, um, yeah, so as I was, as I was saying, uh, the goal right now is to understand the algorithmic dependence and the data dependence of, of trained model solutions for very general class of machine learning models. So what is a machine learning model? We started with a sort of abstract function f of x parameterized by theta. And um, so when we talk about a model abstractly, we use f. When we talk about a model in concretely, we use z. Um, I, I don't know why I don't make the rules. I guess I just make the slides. But that's what we're going to do. And in to highlight this contrast between abstract and concrete, I'm now going to decorate um, the particular function with a vectorial index, so this index i um allows my model to output not just uh one one number but a vector of numbers so there's an out different different outputs and then we're also going to decorate it with a sample index um so this this uh we'll try to use delta lowercase delta when um just we're considering an input from a a, a, a general data set curly d um so we'll call that a sample index and furthermore we're going to use a compressed notation um, because slides are difficult to make, where rather than writing x each time, I'm going to use a semicolon and then write this sort of index um, after the semicolon um, as, a, as an index to the function rather than writing x, x of delta. Um, but this is supposed to um, um, tell you which particular sample I'm considering within the data set. So now that um, I've explained some notation, um, what how do we, how should we begin talking about machine learning models? Um, again, um, 
in some sense, as, as we were saying to, well, uh, let me walk that sentence back. So one way to characterize a function, of course, is by its Taylor expansion. So one thing we can do is we have some function, um, some model Z parameterized by theta, and I'm just going to Taylor expand it around a point. I picked the point of theta equals zero. So I'm going to take this function and I'm going to set um, expand it around um, the place where the model parameters are set to zero. And so again, we have potentially an infinite number of terms, very which describes a very general, completely arbitrary machine learning model. And here, so again, compared to when we were very schematic before, now we're going to be less schematic. So you I is a parameter index, and there's going to be capital P total model parameters. It's just notation. And um, in, in general, a generic nonlinear model, and here nonlinear means in terms of the parameters, is going to be intractable. If we truncate this to uh, what I'll call a cubic model, um, as, as uh, Sho will, will, will explain in detail, um, this actually is sufficient to describe an MLP at order one over n. Um, I guess I already talked about how we just need to keep track of the three terms, uh, the, the function and, and the three derivatives. And so um, understanding, if we understand the dynamics of a very general cubic model, that those dynamics would apply to MLPs. Um, and for pedagogical purposes, it's even sufficient to truncate further to a quadratic model to illustrate nonlinear dynamics and understand um, representation learning and the dependence of of the solution on the learning algorithm. And so in the next lecture, we're going to study quadratic models. And for the rest of this lecture, hopefully time permitting, we're going to study a linear model, um, which uh, uh, describes, uh, which is sufficient for describing infinite width networks, as well as being um, kind of central model in statistics and machine learning. And Andrea has talked a bunch about linear models. We're going to talk about it some way overlap, but in some ways a little bit different. So the simplest linear model uh, is just a one layer uh, or a zero hidden layer neural network. Um, and here, so we have an input X. Again, J is, is, is uh, an index over the components of the input. So for instance, if it's an image, those would be pixels. And D says which particular input. Then I'm going to act on it with a matrix WIJ, um, which um, the, the J component has N zero different components. Um, and remember the model uh, outputs I components, so the I um, uh, so the W I should say is a, is a N out by N zero matrix. And then we shift it with a bias. And, and so this, this model is very simple. And I assume again, that everyone here is familiar with neural networks. So it should be clear why I'm calling this a one, a one layer or zero hidden layer neural network, but it's also called a simple linear model. And while one important point, um, that hopefully, uh, just, I want to believe her so that it's not confused. While this model is linear both in parameters, um, so the weights and the biases, so again, I'll, I'll continue to use theta to collectively refer to the parameters. Um, and so while it's linear both in the parameters and, and the input, the, excuse me, the linear in linear model takes its name from the dependence of the parameters theta and, and not on the, on the input x. Um, and uh, I guess should add, if, if, if we, uh, well, let me add it on the next slide. So um, one, one immediate thing to notice is that while um, the components of the input can serve as a reasonable set of, of features for function approximation, in, in general, they don't. Um, and one traditional way to fix this inherited from statistics is, is to engineer better features. Uh, and such an approach was necessary when computers were less powerful and models had to be much more simpler to optimize. Um, and uh, so just, just to explain what I mean, for instance, rather than um, considering uh, using the components, the input to be the features like the XJs, um, perhaps it would also be useful for the model to take into account features um, like XJ times XK that let us consider the dependence of one component on another. Um, and, and more generally, um, we might design a fixed set of feature functions um, uh, by J um, that takes in an input and transforms it into some feature space um, that is designed to work well for the underlying task at hand. And sometimes this is called a generalized linear model. Um, I'll just call this a linear model. And um, so I should add, by the way, that that if if instead we have a nonlinear model in the parameters, but leave the linear, but 
it's still linear in the inputs, that would be a neural network with uh, linear activations. So there's two uses of the word linear here, and I just want to emphasize here what's linear is, is in the parameters, but this function can be nonlinear in the input, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and sort of as I was saying, in, in, in this type of machine learning model, all the complicated modeling work goes into the construction of these feature functions a priori. Um, so there's some tasks that you want to solve, and you try to pick these phi j's such that they uh, have captured the important features of, of the data set. And then, um, and then um, oh, sorry, well, I'll, I'll finish that sentence in, in another slide. Here, what, what I've done in going from um, this slide to this slide is subsume the bias vector into the weight matrix um, by, by taking the first feature function and setting it equal to one. And then we were able to include this bias as part of as part of the weights. I imagine this is familiar for most people, but I guess if something's confusing, please, please let me know. Um, and uh, yeah, so we can still think of this model as a one layer neural network, but it, essentially now we pre-process um, the input with this function phi, phi j of x. Um, and, and so again, the idea is that, that if you do a good enough job ahead of time, um, understanding what your data is and picking these phi j's, then um, 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 this model will be, okay, the slide I thought was next wasn't, wasn't next. Um, but uh, what I was going to say is that the model will be simple to train and, um, and, and perform well. Um, uh, let me see how much time. So uh, I'm gonna very quickly run through an introduction to supervised learning because I think everyone knows what that is. Um, and just in case there's some notational things that, that need to be kept straightforward. But in general, um, this, this sort of notion of function approximation that we've been talking about, um, we can um, really what we have in mind is supervised learning. So there's some data distribution, joint distribution, x comma y, where x is an input and y is a label for a function. And um, we want to learn a probabilistic model that learns the distribution of, of labels given the input. Um, and the more accurately it can predict a true label, for a novel input, uh, and we, and um, we want it to, um, and and we hope that it can predict a true label um, for a novel input example x. Um, okay, um, so and before we we fit the model parameters, we should just establish what we mean by making good predictions. Um, so for for a typical um, pair of input labels sampled from the data distribution, we want the model to be as close to the label as possible on average. And to measure this proximity, we need to define something auxiliary, um, which is uh, often called the loss function or an objective function. And um, so this is, in addition to the model, this is something extra that you have to specify. Um, and it should have the property that the closer um, the model output is to the, to the label, the smaller the loss. And a very intuitive choice for this, we've seen this in previous lecture, is the mean squared error loss. Um, so we care about the difference between the model output and the label. Um, we don't care about the sign, so we square it. Um, the factor of one half is customary, and um, um, this will be a, a nice choice to keep in mind when when we um, when we're considering um, concrete losses. And finally, um, to train our model, we we want to find a configuration of the model parameters that minimizes the training loss. And so that's that's what that says in equations. We want to minimize the training loss. Um, more notation, a uh, curly a is going to be the training set. Um, so that, that that's the set of examples that we're going to use for training. And to assess the generalization property of the model, kind of the, the whole goal of this endeavor, um, we, we have a separate set called the test set, which we'll use curly b for. And it's used to evaluate the performance of the model after training. And um, as some more notational bookkeeping, uh, to try to keep all these things separate, we're going to use tildes on uh, alpha indices to represent training set inputs. Um, generic inputs will just use delta, and test set inputs will use beta with a with dot on top. And, and we'll try to keep these separate to, in order to um, make it clear what which quantities we're talking about and what inputs they're evaluated on. So now, um, let me just, okay. So supervised learning with with this linear model is is called linear regression generally um, and again it should be familiar not only from machine learning but um, basically it's the workhorse work workhorse of statistical analysis and all I've done here is I've substituted the linear model um, into into the mean squared error loss 
and we can be uh, uh sorry we're gonna we're gonna solve the linear model now that's that's what we're going to do and that will probably be all i'll have time for for the rest of the day um so we're gonna be the way we're gonna solve it first um is we're going to be entirely naive about it and try direct optimization so you know if you want to find uh, extrema of a function you take a derivative and you set it equal to zero so doing that to the above loss equation is going to give an implicit equation for the optimal weight matrix uh, w star the weight matrix at the end of training um, and simple algebraic rearrangement gives gives this equation on the bottom of the slide and to solve this implicit equation we're going to need to define a symmetric um, feature matrix of features um, so here this, this is summing over all the inputs in the training set. And these are feature indices, um, the IJ indices. And um, it's simple to see, given this definition and given this implicit, implicit equation, applying its inverse to both sides, we can find a simple solution. Um, and the solution um, um, is going to depend uh, on the training data, as it should, because we're using the training data to train our model. Um, and note that it depends linearly on the labels and in a generally nonlinear, more complicated way on, on the inputs or on the features. So having, having done that, that was pretty easy. Um, I think um, one of the previous lectures said that, or kept mentioning that linear, um, linear models are solved by a simple matrix inversion. This, this, is, this is that matrix inversion. Um, and having done this, we can then um, use those fully trained parameters in order to make predictions on novel examples that we haven't seen before on, on the test set. Um, and uh, one way to think about this is, um, as it's typically thought about, is we, we do the training once, we get a matrix, um, a n out times um, nf or nf plus one, because we're including the bias, matrix of, of optimal parameters. We, for, we throw away the training data. And then every time we get a new training point, we first um, bring it to feature space to compute, um, you know, run it through this function phi, and then we operate on it with this optimal um, parameter matrix, and that gives us a prediction. Um, but since we are, uh, wrote this, since we, um, and, that, and that's in some sense akin to what we do in, in, in standard deep learning um, settings, we train our models, we find the optimal weights and biases, uh, and then we don't need the training data anymore, and we can make begin to make predictions on our on our on our test set. Um, on the other hand, it's not very illuminating. So there's another thing you can do, which is take the solution, plug it plug it in, and try and analyze um, the solution more directly. So here I've plugged in the optimal weights from the previous slide and and shifted some things around, um, and uh, we see that there's some complicated expression in square brackets. Um, but the solution really is is kind of a linear interpolation or involves um, you know is is built in terms of the the previous labels in the training set. Um, and so um, first one thing to point out is that this involves the inversion of of our matrix M. Um, I guess it involved the inversion when we com computed um, I, we, we already said this, but it's important to emphasize it here. Um, and if the number of features is very large, then this might be a very big matrix. And so it might be um, computationally difficult to invert. Um, so uh, in lieu of that, or, uh, or one thing we can do is introduce uh, an object that's called the kernel. Um, and so this is a data by data symmetric matrix. Uh, and here where now we have two phi's, two feature functions, um, and rather than summing over the data to get M, we're summing over the features. So it's like an inner product of, of features or an inner product in feature space. And this is a measure of the similarity between um, two inputs in, in this feature space, two different inputs, um, X delta one and X delta two in this feature space. Um, and we'll also, um, again, some more notational bookkeeping. Um, we're going to denote an, uh, uh, training set by training set dimensional submatrix of the kernel evaluated on the training set as k tilde. So we'll decorate it with a tilde. Um, and then we're going to, when we write inverses, we're going to use raised sample indices. And so, um, so defining its inverse as this, um, or this equation defines what we mean by, by the inverse. And, and the, the important point though here is that the, the 
inverse of the submatrix of the kernel um, is not the it's not the inverse of the whole kernel then evaluated on the submatrix. It's the inverse of the submatrix of the kernel. Um, and these are different objects. And in particular, we're going to need the inverse of the um, submatrix of the kernel evaluated on the training set only. Um, so I didn't do anything. I'm just giving notation. Um, and um, also note that given, um, given the definition here of the kernel um, for this inverse to exist, um, we, we must be in what's called the over-parameterized regime, where the number of features plus one um, is greater than or equal to the, the, the or just greater than, or uh, the, the, the number of, of samples in our training set. So um, see, I think, because Boris gave me an intro, I'm gonna take five extra minutes. Um, this great. is great. Um, this is algebra that you can um, perhaps go through in your own time, the, the point is that we're trying to find a simpler expression in terms of these new objects of the square brackets that I had of the solution on the previous slides, uh, previous two slides ago, I guess, um, and some simple manipulations um, using the definition of, of the kernel and the definition of the this matrix M, we're able to see that operating this with the square operating the square bracket on the kernel submatrix, we get a simple expression in terms of the kernel um, and multiplying that expression by the inverse submatrix of the kernel, um, we get an expression for the square brackets, a simple one in terms of the kernel submatrix evaluated on the training set only, and then a kernel um, on a, that mixes between test and training set sets. And altogether, this lets us rewrite the prediction of our linear model in a, in a different way, um, which, is, which is this equation here. Um, and what, what this equation sh shows is that um, we can either think about it as a, um, where we had the optimal parameters and then we take an input in and we compute its features and we use the optimal parameters to make a prediction, or we can analyze it um, in this dual way where now we have a set of labels in our training set. We don't forget about the training set. And then every time we get a new input um, X beta dot, um, we, fir we first act with the inverse of the kernel on the training set only on these labels. And then we compute an inner product of that um, with with the uh, with the um, kernel where one of the inputs is the new training example, and then the other inputs we get a vector of, of across all the training set. Um, I, the important point is that um, the model prediction is just a linear interpolation of the labels in our training set. Um, so it's we're just kind of reshuffling the data that we've already seen. Um, the coefficients are computed in this nice way with the, with the, with the kernel. Um, and the basis is sort of the, the inputs that we've already seen. And it's just linear in these y's. And um, so when the predictions of a linear model are computed in this way, it's known as a kernel machine or, or, or as kernel methods. And I think, great, then that is, that is where I want to stop. Um, and next time, we're going to talk about gradient descent. And then we're going to extend kernel methods to what we call nearly kernel methods to analyze, to go beyond the linear model, which is um, the case of, of primary interest for us. So thanks. Great. Thanks a lot for the lecture, Dan. Um, does anybody thanks, have any questions? We have a couple minutes for sure. Looks like there's some questions if you have time to field them, Dan. Sure. I'll take the customary half hour between um, where everyone breaks between the the talks in the symposium to, to answer questions. So please go ahead. Uh, I had a quick question about uh, the aspect ratios and their utility. Uh, uh -huh. So you said that uh, when the aspect ratio is much smaller than one, that's the regime that we're going to focus on because that's analytically tractable in some sense and also useful. Uh, yep. And when the aspect ratio is much bigger than one, that's pretty much useless. Uh, can you briefly comment on when aspect ratio is close to one? Well, I, yeah, so really it's not one, it's the other scale R star that, that I alluded to. Um, and so, so mm -hmm. like whenever, whenever you see these parametric things, it's, it's, um, not always obvious that one is the right number to compare to. And it turns out there's, um, there's, uh, I think we'll cover this in the lax lecture, but there's, there's a nice criteria that, that tells us about um, kind of the mutual information between neurons and and uh, 
and it sort of rises and then falls and picks out kind of a, a nice aspect ratio. And beyond that, um, things start to um, behave poorly, um, both uh, in theory and in terms of we'll need, um, there'll be truncation error and also in practice that, that we'll start to see fluctuations and things will get harder and harder to train for, for the vanilla MLPs. Um, we might also talk about how um, we can we can sort of push this ratio around by by adding residual connections, and that's that's something else that um, we 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 might get a chance to talk about. Um, but it's not necessarily one; it's just a a kind of fixed scale that either you compute or maybe you do experiments and you figure out what the scale is empirically. And so there's um, the way I would think about it is that there's benefit to depth for fixed width up to some certain depth. And then after that, it starts to make things worse um, in general. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Um, I have a question. So uh, if let's if let's say we want to understand the effect of depth, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that in the infinite width case, the aspect ratio is going to be zero. So uh, yep. do you think it is it is going to be futile to understand uh, the benefit of depth in, in the NTK or this infinite width regime or just trying to understand that. I see. I, well, so I guess the what what I was trying to emphasize is that, um, in some sense, in many senses, the in in this NTK infinite width regime, um, you, you have since you just have a linear model, you effectively have a a, um, a network without depth. But there is this thing that you might mean, which is that the particular NTK that you get does change as a function of depth. And, and that's something that Sho, Sho will discuss in, in his lectures. Um, so so the in some sense, depth can change the type of linear model that you get, but it um, it doesn't change the fact that you have a linear model. I see, thanks. Mm -hmm. So I have another question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in Andreas' uh, talk, he introduced this model with the output scale alpha, right? And I was wondering, I mean, I'm not sure if you watch it, but so it's like in the Shizat and the Bach paper. Um, I was wondering whether you can do the same kind of expansion in this parameter rather than uh, than fixing the your output scale to be one over square root of n and, and uh, doing that and goes to infinity limit. Um, well, let me see if I understand your question. So you, you, you of course can do whatever you want theoretically. You're, you know, and and there may or may not be interesting um, things to to find there. Um, but, uh, and I'm not sure I fully. I the the alpha uh, scales the output of the model. Is that is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I I mean, yeah, you can do some sort of analysis like like that. Um, I guess my comment is that. Um, the thing that is of interest to me is what is done in practice. And so in practice, we, we don't scale things like that. Um, I mean, maybe if there's some reason to, maybe, maybe we should, and then, then it would kind of motivate studying that regime. But unless, unless there's, there's a, an obvious reason to, I'm not sure why, why that would be a, a, um, a thing of particular interest. And I mean, I, my understanding is that sort of scaling makes things tractable in theory, but um, I don't think we need to do that. We can make things tractable in theory as as they already are, um, if that makes sense. I mean, I guess other um, there is this feature regime. Uh, I don't know. For example, in Brett Young's work, um, and he just uses a different output scaling, which is one over n, right? Or also in um, Andreas' work on um, the mean field regime, right? And sure, but those those models don't correspond to to what people actually do when they when they turn on PyTorch and 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 they instantiate models. So that's I mean, because those, of those... initialization, right? I mean, so, sorry, that's just because it's a it's in a sense it's some arbitrary choice, right? The output scale. Uh, sure, but I I guess the the thing I'm interested in describing is the phenomenology of of, of what people do, um, and and it's not. Um, I think it's not obvious whether those regimes that that say Greg is studying are, are equivalent to, or at least when we talked to Greg, we um, it wasn't obvious whether whether these regimes are are um, whether whether they're describing the same thing. Um, so 
you know, it's certainly interesting as a mathematical object that that you can take an infinite width limit with a different parameterization and describe some sort of feature learning, but it's not the same. Like the thing I want to understand is when they're exciting uh, deep networks that have some exciting behavior, how are those networks working? And so that's 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 what we're hoping to describe with this this sort of analysis. Uh, maybe the question is also coming from like, so I'm coming more from computational neuroscience background and and the RNN models that are used there. Um, let's say before people just turned on PyTorch, they all had a one over n scaling um, simply because that's kind of the corresponding scaling if you want to care about uh, developing features, right? So in a sense, there this one over n scaling um, has always been there or for the last twenty years. Okay, but so then then perhaps um, those models are useful for describe for 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 um, the the purposes of, of neuroscience, um, right? And and that that's certainly interesting. But um, those those um, those models aren't the ones that are that are used primarily um, as as deep learning models. So I mean, they're all interesting, right? It's just a question of what you want to understand. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not a critique. It's it's really a question um, of whether you can make sense of pro do, using your techniques and approaching this other limit. Um, oh, I see. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think I think you could ask whether the sort of um, feature regime that that you're describing, like, I mean, I, I would think it's a central question in some sense of that work. Is whether it describes the the same feature learning that that occurs in networks in practice. Um, so that that would I think is a very motivated type of question to to answer. Um, in some sense, I, I don't have to answer it because my 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 mechanism is, is yeah, different. Okay. But I think it it is interesting whether they're the same. I mean, either they're the same, and then that's a cool different technique that gives you the same sort of thing, or they're different, and then it's worth understanding like whether one is better or how they're different or why they're different. I mean, it's, it's interesting all the different ways that, 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 that it might come out. So, so I certainly agree in that sense. Okay. Thanks. Of course. Other questions. Okay. Maybe it looks like there aren't more questions. So let's thank Dan again for a very interesting take on initialization and linear models. We've been initialized into the course, it seems. Um, Thanks. Yeah, yep. so so as I mentioned at the very beginning of the day, there are TA sessions, which you all should certainly attend if you would like. Um, and otherwise, tomorrow morning, the primary courses will continue. Yeah, I wish you all a good rest of the day. <laughs>